Well, the crimes were very bizarre. Usually in a mass murder, some person of rather low intellect flips out and murders 10 or 12 or 15 people. Uh, here, when the, when the murders first took place, they called them the, the, the uh, Tate murders. Everyone called, called them the Tate murders because of Sharon Tate. Then Manson appears on the scene, and he's so, uh, what are the words, charismatic, unusual, colorful, that he upstaged the victims. It became the Manson case. I mean, here you have this little guru, five feet, two inches tall, gathers around him a young bunch of kids from average American families. You'd never expect them to be mass murderers. Convinces them that he's a second coming of Christ and the devil. Ultimately gets them to kill total strangers for him at his command. I mean, if you look at everything in the amalgam, this is an extremely bizarre, strange case. One thing that you will hardly ever see is the, the murder of an uh, eight and a half month pregnant woman. And not only was Sharon Tate stabbed, but while she was still alive, she was hung uh, from the rafters uh, in her living room. Uh, that's, that's something that you can never get over. That's one of the worst things I, I've seen as a prosecutor. I would describe Manson as a, an instrument of the evil supernatural. The crimes are just sort of the fruit of the tree. The crimes are just the part you can see. And they're not the most, although they're the most tragic consequences interpersonally, they're not the most, what do you say, the most threatening part of the situation. The most threatening part is what causes that, you know, the destruction. And what we saw was the destruction, but that's not as important as what caused it. Historians uh, in the United States, a lot of them do attribute the uh, demise of the generation of the 60s to the Tate-LaBianca murders and the uh, Manson family, and certainly the hippies got uh, terrible publicity from uh, Manson and the, uh, and the family, and I think it did hasten their demise. Before they were kind of just druggies, free spirit, throwing flowers around, taking their clothes off, free sex, and stuff like that, but then after the Tate LaBianca murders, uh, people became genuinely afraid of hippies, which was misguided, but that happened. I told you, and I'll tell you again, I did not break the law. I can do anything I want and never break the law. I did not break the law. Is it registered? It's the same thing Jesus Christ told Pilate, man. He said, you're blaming me for your problems. You're trying to put the blame over on me, and it doesn't fit. I'm not Richard Milhouse Nixon. I'm Charles Millis Manson. of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. This is the end, beautiful friend. 
This is the end My only friend it's as if there was an expectation of an apocalypse and a series of dress rehearsals for it. There was a sense of doom in the air, and a good deal of that had to do with the Vietnam War, the polarization in the country over the Vietnam War, and over drugs and the drug culture. Overall, there was a sense of anticipation, almost a hunger for an end. And the culture was full of intimations of ending. Jim Morrison's song, The End, might be taken as representative of that mood. Father, yes, son, I want to kill you. Mother, I want to. Leslie said, yeah, I killed her. And he said, why did you kill her? He said, I killed her to stop the war. He said, what did you think about when you killed her? He said, well, I said, at least you won't be killing, sending your kids to, to war. Why don't we do it in the road? And then all these kids are out here doing it in the road, you dig? And then you're singing all that stuff and saying, well, it's all Charlie's fault. Hey, man, I didn't write the songs. I, that's not my generation. My generation's Bing Crosby, man. I'm not a generation of the Beatles. to face the fact that their products, their children, children of the system, would do this. Uh, they didn't want to hear our reasons, which was really an expression of why the young uh, were totally dis... I wouldn't even use the word satisfied. We were alienated from our, our culture. So then you have a, an ex-con with no education. Who would be better to blame for the uh, behavior of America's own children? Uh, so even though during the trials, the defendants, the female defendants, were very willing and capable of saying why they killed the people that were killed. Each woman had her reason for doing what they did. Say if I had been there in body, then my emphasis would have been maybe different. They didn't want to hear it. They made Manson the, the, the culprit, the bad guy, the demonic manipulator of these poor middle class, upper middle class children. Uh, they said that he uh, wanted power and that he wanted to be a star in music, which is such baloney. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. In the summer of 69, men landed on the moon. Uh, a week later were the Manson murders, and a week later was Woodstock. And then, in that November of 69, was the biggest anti-war demonstration that had ever happened in the United States. Now, I'm sure there was violence at that demonstration. It was cops beating demonstrators. Um, then the, the U.S., the, I think the following year, U.S. invade, under Nixon, U.S. invaded Cambodia. I think a quarter of a million uh, Cambodian people were killed. We, there was a humongous demonstration in Washington, where, again, demonstrators really got beat up. But there was also escalating violence within the movement. The way that I understand it is that we kept demonstrating against the war. We kept trying to end the war in Vietnam, and it didn't end. A second wave of MPs with fixed bayonets in scabbards move into position. When I had a radio show in San Francisco, uh, and it was about the time that the My Lai massacre occurred, and I compared Lieutenant Calley to Charles Manson, 
and the soldiers under Callie to the family under Manson. It was similar because they both had to do with brainwashing. Um, you know, these were American boys who um, were turned into killers. And the same thing happened with the Manson family. They were conned by Manson uh, into his value system and became killers. Um, Manson was kind of uh, an individualized version of, of the state, but they both had their hierarchy and they both had uh, the following orders. So I think the, the Nuremberg trial would apply equally to the Manson family and the soldiers in the Milai massacre. 1944, I went into a judge that was the same judge that was in Nuremberg who was hanging whopping soldiers over there in the war. I stayed in the judge's robes under Dr. Hartman. I'm like his little boy. He raised me all my life. Everything I know, I got inside. I don't have any parents. I don't have mothers and fathers and family unit like you guys do, you see? I live in prison. I was raised inside the judge's body. I'm in the judge's room. You've all judged yourselves poorly. Are you guys proud of a system where a man cannot defend himself? Are you proud of it? That was an eight-month trial with uh, many witnesses. Uh, that, it, that was a trial, eight months of prosecution testimony. Uh, they've convicted these people, and you are next, all of you. What are you there doing? Are many, what are you listen doing now? listen to me. There are many more men who are experiencing the same injustice. There's a revolution coming very soon. And the love will shine. It's your constitution. How do you go, Charlie? You know what they're doing to your constitution? What's that? What are they doing? They're making a joke out of your constitution. Love's not in your courtroom. And God is not in your heart. What happened in this day? They do what they want. Manson came here, it was probably the kind of scene he would enjoy very much. A lot of available women, a lot of drug traffic, a lot of um, psychic energy. Everybody was using drugs every day and, and walking down the streets, stoned out of their heads or having bad trips. And It was an environment I think he might have enjoyed. It was, it was, it was kind of hellish. It was something like Hieronymus Bosch might have enjoyed painting if he were alive in those times. There were so many freaks and so, and so many extremes, but the good people, the, the original people had left. They were gone. So all you had here was these biker gangs, speed freaks, and these innocent young people who came looking for the promise of peace and love and got exploited by these kind of characters. Peace and love, the 60s, flower children, da 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 da. That's the kind of thing that would give him an entree into the most vulnerable market. See, if he'd have thought he could control uh, some other group, he would have got their nomenclature down and went there. But this was the most vulnerable. It was obviously the most vulnerable because it was, uh, it was morally deficient. It was young and inexperienced. It was a, a great vacuum of of what to do, where to go, very good opportunity. So he learns to say, peace and love, la la It's the right bait for the fish. Now the nickname is hash berries, the favorite pastimes of the hippies besides taking drugs are demonstrations and partying, seminars and groups of discussions. There was like a, a war between the generations. The older people saw the hippie movement as, as representing some kind of anarchism, some threat to their entire way of life. And they felt threatened enough by it 
to overreact, and there was really no, no place in society you could feel unthreatened. There was no way, place to hide by 68. I'm not a child of the 60s. I wasn't a hippie. I'm a child of the 50s. I'm a riff. My heroes were World War II. My heroes were uh, Cliffs of Dover, man. My heroes were uh, uh, Eleanor Wants War. <laughs> you remember all them guys? In other words, like uh, Roosevelt. I'm, you know, I'm not a kid. Uh, I'm not a kid. I'm almost 60 years old, man. When Charlie was arrested and all the, the family was arrested and all the violence came into the newspapers, it was had a devastating effect on the counterculture in the Haight-Ashbury community. And it was like, dream became a nightmare. Everything went, had gone wrong. And of course, part of the problem was that that's what the media focused on. The worst examples of the counterculture to show that the 60s was you know, all negative. The Manson family became the symbol of the counterculture in the 60s rather than the free clinic movement or rock concerts or all the positive stuff. So it was a very violent, very uh, uh, disillusioning uh, year. Free sex, no accountability, drugs, uh, acceptable anarchy, anarchy. And what do we expect to get? Do we expect to get utopia? Wish we would, but no. No, well, that's not what we're going to get. We're going to get chaos. And we, that we got. We got chaos. There's a time for living The time keeps on flying Think you're loving, baby And all you're doing is crying I was in the uh, Terminal Island Penitentiary or correctional facility, if you will, being corrected for my importing of marijuana. And Charlie was in the yard singing. And I had some friends in the music business, and I heard Charlie singing. He was rather like a young Frankie Lane. He had that kind of that kind of that lilt in his voice. Frustration and doubt. Well, I thought he was. I thought his voice was good, and it was during the, the period, the folk period, and the young hippie stuff, and the new music. And I thought he would fit in. Charlie didn't like the hippies or the hippie movement. Uh, Charlie. Uh, if everybody would do this, say peace and peace and love, and Charlie would always go like this, one, one, us, me. So Charlie just used the hippie movement, I think, for his own benefit. I definitely didn't think he had that, 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 uh, that, that real love that people really were trying to put out. Here's one of my sins, and I'll, I'll confess to you clearly and openly to the world. I never realized how much mind I was holding with those people. I never realized how weak you people are outside. He's a very charismatic person, and there was no reality testing, and a lot of people were taking LSD and other drugs, and Charlie would use LSD to reinforce that he had magic, that he was this all-powerful person that could make things move, that could read people's minds and know what their thoughts were and so that was all part of that psychedelic uh, drug counterculture then if you back up and say well that's crazy you know reality test but the whole community was like that because there were so many susceptible young people that came here that were looking for something to believe in and Charlie's philosophy was very appealing to a lot of these young people when I met Charlie, what impressed me m most uh, that I did not see in my own culture growing up was this strong 
a sense of brotherhood, loyalty, honor, and, and, and brotherhood. And that immediately struck a chord within me. Charlie impressed word is your bond, your bond is, you know, word is your, yeah. man's no better than his word type thing. That struck a chord in me. My, my dad believed that. Sticking together, word being good, it's like a war, it's like a soldier, reality. In other words, if these people in Hollywood have to go, so be it. That made sense to me, and that made sense to all of us. In war, you know, sometimes killing is uh, needed. And they said, well, don't you feel any remorse? I said, feel remorse about what? I didn't have anything to do with killing those people. I was involved in the episode that was surrounding that. I was involved in changing the world for Adwa. I was involved in all the things I was involved in. I was involved in a music group called The Family. I was involved with a, a lot of different people doing a lot of different things, but directing someone to go do something like, you know, that's, you know. With the Manson family, a number of the girls had white middle class backgrounds, although many of the families were very problemed with a lot of alcoholism and sexual abuse. And he used the women sexually to recruit men and money, and Charlie was always the one that determined what the girls did and who they did it with. And that was a very powerful tool for control, because if you were a male and Charlie said, no, you were out, and if you were male and Charlie said yes, you were in. So he had absolute, that was one of the things that amazed me even before I knew anything about the violence, with what absolute total control he had over these girls. Most of them were heavily involved before they met Manson in the use of uh, hallucinogenic drugs, psychedelic drugs. So in that sense, you couldn't call them innocent. No, Manson didn't knock on, on their door and say, I want to talk to you for a moment and take them by the hand and introduce them to a life of mass murder. No, no. In fact, I think when he joined his family, he himself probably was not thinking of murder. I don't think that. I think that's, that's what eventuated down the line. I think what happened, he saw the tremendous control that he had over these people. And he's got so much hostility towards society that he finally realized, I can use these minions to vent my spleen on society for me. It eventuated into mass murder. But when he first formed this family, I doubt very much that he was thinking about crime. I think he was thinking about free love and, uh, and music and LSD. The hot weather gave the tribal stench. It gave the excuse for the natives to get restless. It gave an excuse for these fools to rush about and paint their bodies and roll around and eat health food and sleep on mattresses and do nothing but get up at two and wonder where the party was. It was a wonderful time. It was great. It didn't cost any money. And no one, and the only penalties were no financial future and an extended immaturity. Other than that, there was nothing wrong. In the 19th century, they had a thing called the Grand Tour, where people from North America would rush around Europe and, and, and see life. And the Grand Tour in the 60s was love ends. Uh, burning your bra, eating health food, staying up all night, playing music, eight people living in one floor. That was one of the positive things that Charles Manson offered, was an alternative to that doomsday thing. Why not live off the land? Why not live by your wits? Why not live for the moment? <laughs> Now, we've all read the press reportings of the report that was handed in by the Senate subcommittee. As a matter of fact, I have here a copy of a report of the district attorney of Alameda County. It concerns a dance in the men's gymnasium at the University of California. The incidents are so bad, 
so contrary to our standards of human behavior that I couldn't possibly recite them to you here from this platform in detail. Three rock and roll bands were in the center of the gymnasium playing simultaneously all during the dance. And all during the dance, movies were shown on two screens at the opposite ends of the gymnasium. These movies were the only lights in the gym proper. They consisted of color sequences that gave the appearance of different colored liquids spreading across the screen, followed by shots of men and women on occasion. Shots were the men and women's nude torsos on occasion and persons twisted and gyrated in provocative and sensual fashion. The smell of marijuana was prevalent all over the entire building. Sexual misconduct was blatant. At 2 a.m., an electrician had to be summoned by a custodian to cut off the power. There was the rise of the communal movement in the 60s, which was a fascinating new lifestyle in the sense that you had uh, kibbutzim in Israel, and you had traditional communes, but the commune movement for basically the white middle-class kids dropping out was relatively new. Al Rose, who was the administrator of our medical section at that time, um, actually dropped out and lived in that type of commune. With the, uh, with the Manson family for a short time, and then he came back out and described it to me. And so we used that as a case example and published a paper in the Journal of Psychedelic Drug called The Group Marriage Commune, a Case Study. And the Manson philosophy was peace and health and love, and it was interesting that he changed everybody's name and stressed that nobody could be the leader, but by ridding everybody of power, he became the all-powerful leader. I remember when Charles Manson first drove up uh, that winding road to the hog farm. A lot of the hog farmers were very enamored with his style. And he, I could see how he could, uh, you know, mesmerize people. At one point in the early evening, we, we gathered in this meditation circle and started oming, making the sound of the universe all together. Oh, you know, like that. And uh, uh, in, in the middle of this ohm circle, which was quite beautiful, actually, uh, uh, Charlie leaned out the window of his black bus and he's choking. <laughs> and his, his wives are leaning out saying, stop, stop it, stop it. And everybody stopped oming. And Charlie stopped choking, and he leaped out of the window of the bus and landed square on uh, and, and in mid-delivery of the scathing put-down of our entire scene. And I don't know where it came from. Just uh, when you rise up beyond yourself, somehow I was lifted into some archetypal role where I just said, you get out. <laughs> And he did! <laughs> yeah, I'd give anything to watch a rerun of that little move. <laughs> I'm so, so glad he didn't take offense. I went with my husband, Abby. We were both founders of the Yippies. Well, there were mostly women, and there were a few guys, some of whom I think were later arrested and charged. But the women were the predominant ones, and they looked, it looked like your ideal hippie commune. I come from New York. I'm Jewish. I have dark hair. These girls were blonde and, and had red hair. And the sort of, they were sort of the hippie ideals that you saw, you know, there's that sort of racism. I mean, you know, who, whoever decides what the, the ideal is, is, you know, the reigning white culture. But they looked more like hippies probably than I did, or like the, the cliche of one. And there was almost seemed like a certain innocence about them on the surface. I think Abby and I were quite spooked the whole time. It was very, very strange, you know. There's a place called Indian Mesa where we have fires and we play music. And we make big circles like you do with the stones. We make big circles and we sing. Ah! And we put our souls in each other. You dig? In other words, and we have sex with each other. Right. Each other. 
we do all the things that you guys are not allowed to do in your culture. But in the culture I live in, we throw all that out the window, and that's what I guess you'd call Satan. The so-called Manson family was a sort of parody of patriarchy. Uh, so part of the revelation was that uh, you could be living in a commune and uh, do all these hip things, and, and, and yet and still be the incarnation of some you know, very primitive form of social organization, which was not uh, a transcendent improvement upon the uh, normal American family, but rather something uh, uh, barbaric. California Highway Patrolman assigned to the uh, California Highway Patrol office at Oakland, California. And during the 60s in the San Francisco Oakland Bay Area, there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of uh, 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 demonstrations and riots all over the Bay Area. And I transferred from uh, that area up here to a quiet area. And then two months later, that's when we went on the, uh, on the Manson raids in Gilbert Wash. I learned about the Manson situation when my boss came into the office one day and said that law enforcement had received uh, some rumors or reports of people out in the desert, namely out in and around the Panamint Mountains in the southern part of the county, uh, running around in dune buggies, uh, sex orgies, drugs, uh, random sharing of affection, doing things that just weren't quite uh, accepted here in Inyo County. searched the building and in the small bathroom area uh, in a commode under the sink the door began opening and this figure crawled out he had been in a fetal position in the cupboard crawled out and stood up in front of me and said hi and at that time I asked him who he was identify himself and he told me Charlie Manson down he impressed upon us that uh, his group was trying to find some place to be alone because the blacks were going to rise up and overwhelm the whites and there was going to be a bloodbath and he stressed that we in uniform uh, number one were cops number two we were white therefore we had two strikes against us immediately and he strongly recommended that we let them go and we flee for our lives. Helter Skelter is what? Race war? How long has there been a race war? How long have we been in race war, English? How long have we been at war with races? Since we come out of the caves and you didn't like Irishmen? It's been a race war. All my life I've been in the middle of a race war. What Manson and the family wanted to do is when they saw that the blacks weren't starting the revolution, they wanted to start the revolution and blame the murders on blacks. And they wanted the murders to be so horrible that whites would get incensed and start going down into the black communities and start killing blacks in retaliation. The word pig was printed in blood on the front door of the Tate residence, and the words death to pigs were printed in blood on the living room wall at the Lobby residence. 
Uh, the word pig in 1969, uh, it, 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 in, in the 70s, it became a word used by the counterculture movement. But in 1969, pig was a word used by groups like the Black Panthers, the black activists. No more brothers in jail. Oh, the pig! The pigs are gonna catch hell. Oh, the pig! No more brothers in jail. People followed the lead of uh, the Black Panthers, who were considered the vanguard. Most of the movement was white and middle class. And there was a lot of guilt about racism. And it was felt that um, black people and other minorities, they'd been living under the worst conditions in our society. And they had to resort to violence, whereas maybe white middle class kids could often be pacifists because their lives weren't threatened in the same way. Cops would much more willingly uh, hold a gun to the head of a minority person and be more violent toward them. The image of the Black Panthers was when they went to the legislative meetings and they had their guns because it was legal. And that image scared a lot of white America because they saw blacks with guns. Uh, even though it was legal, it was a scary image. and. Um, Manson played into that fear by trying to blame his crimes on the Black Panthers. Uh, any con man knows that you have to take something that has a, a level of credibility to it. So Manson exploited the fear of white America uh, by blaming his crimes on blacks. I can reach in your mind and control your fear because you're a coward. I'm going to play any game I can play on you all the way to the White House. And then when I take over, I'm going to laugh and say, you were a bunch of weak people. I don't see how you made it this far. In the latter part of 69, the Weatherman faction declared that they'd cut all ties to civilization, that they were admirers of uh, Charles Manson, that sticking a fork uh, in a person's belly was, uh, was something to go wow about. Wild was the word they used. That, and they shared with Manson the sense of the necessity to go beyond, to be as outrageous as possible. And that's why the Weathermen celebrated Charles Man Manson. They, they named Sharon Tate uh, an enemy for no apparent reason than that Charles Manson had been complicit in murdering her. And they declared that Manson was the incarnation of this spirit of transgression, or the sense that whoever did something wild and out, as outrageous as possible was a comrade in arms. I just remember a magazine, I think it was called Tuesday's Child or something, and I guess they labeled the 1969 as the year of the fork, because when Pat Krenwinkel left a fork in Lena LaBianca's uh, stomach, she wrote war on his, I believe it was his belly, the fort might have been in his chest. And when questioned on the stand why she did that, she said, this is one man who won't be sending his son to war. So the war being a big issue in the 60s with, you know, many, many people, um, that's probably why they chose to adopt Charlie as uh, a, what do you call it, hero. I look back and I feel embarrassed by the enthusiasm with which I regarded uh, the Weather Underground for a short period of time. So, so these are mistakes. I never did anything violent. I was never aligned with them. There were moments when, when you heard that um, maybe the Capitol had been bombed or a building had been bombed, that property had been bombed, and I was happy. And I don't regret that. That was wonderful. This is revolution, that there is absolutely no justification, and that the only thing you can say about the uh, perpetrators of these outrages are they are uh, typical of Hitlerian stormtroopers, and I think we've had enough of that for one lifetime.
there's a t-shirt now that says Charlie was not a surfer and it would seem esoteric to somebody who wouldn't even know what it represents but um, Manson's name became an icon just like Woodstock it was a, a generic term and it, in, in surfing it meant a reckless crazy surfer so if somebody would say that guy's a Manson so young surfers would think oh Charles Manson must have been a surfer which is why there is now that t-shirt that says Charlie was not a surfer sort of like Nixon saying I'm not a crook and he was not a hippie Manson was not a hippie he was um, he was not a hippie, he was not a surfer, he was the Frankenstein product of the American prison system and brought all their values of racism and violence out of prison with him into the society. Manson and I used to have several conversations and he told me at the end of the trial, after the verdict of death came in, he says, you know, Bilyos, he says, you haven't achieved anything. He says, all you've done is send me back to where I came from. And I said, well, yeah, Charlie, but as far as I know, you haven't been in the green room before. The green room is the, uh, the room at, uh, at San Quentin, where they have the death penalty, although he claims to have been resurrected several times. In any event, we jump ahead now, a year later. I'm driving my car, 1972. The car radio's on, and I hear that the U.S. Supreme Court had set aside the death penalty, made all of their rulings retroactive. And the first thing that came into my mind is what Manson had told me. All I had done was send him back to where he came from. And he doesn't mind prison life. I mean, most of his life's been spent behind bars. He's totally institutionalized. He gets out in 1967, may be responsible for 35 murders, convicted of nine, may be responsible for 35, and all we've done is send him back to where he came from. In a sense, and I hate to say this, but in a sense, Manson is, has beaten the rap. He's beaten the rap. So that's the first thing that I thought about what Charlie told me. He said, you haven't achieved anything at all. He's sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, well, mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, let's, 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 let's say this. Am I honest? You know, I can say anything. I don't really know what sorry means. I've been sorry all my life. I was sorry I was born, is what my mother told me. Uh, I've been at the bottom of this pile as long as I can remember. Everybody's had permission to bite any part of me they want to chew up. I don't really, honestly, know what a lot of those words mean you guys use. What does sorry mean? Uh, uh, I hurt. I've been beat with the leather strap. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry because I'm hurt or I'm sorry because why did I get beat? I don't even understand why I got beat. I just got beat. Why am I getting beat? Why are you got me in a cell? Why can't I wear clothes? Why can't I do like other human beings? Why do I have to be why am I into this? I'm asking all these whys to myself as you ask those whys to me. I don't know how to deal with this sorry thing, guy. They keep asking me about this remorse thing. I, I'm not, I, I don't have a mind that way. My mind is what works. If something works, it functions. Uh, I, I have a mind in procedure. I understand procedure. I understand war. I understand rules, the regulations. I don't understand sorry. Father, yes, son, I want to kill you. 